So in your breakout rooms, you're free to talk uh, however you like in the knowledge that nothing is being recorded there. Only what you bring back to this room and report back to this room will be recorded. So let me hand over to Jan, who will introduce our, our panellists. Great, thanks Rory. Um, welcome to those who have just joined us and welcome back to those who've been with us this morning. Um, this morning we've been looking at um, new cooperativism and uh, SDGs or su sustainability um, and we've ranged a little bit around the subject areas and some of that has overlapped with what we want to talk about today which is around understanding co-op values and principles um, and some of the challenges and applications uh, going forward in terms of looking at that in a, a new cooperative um, lens, if you like. So my name's Jan Myers. I'm here in capacity of being a member of, uh, of uh, UK Society for Cooperative Studies. And our two panelists today are Sonia Novkovic and Julia Galera. Um, Sonia is Professor of Economics at St. Mary's University in Halifax in Canada, which is the home of the International Centre of Cooperative Management and CIARC, which is the Centre of Excellence in Accounting and Reporting for Cooperatives. She's also the chair of the ICA Committee on Cooperative Research and the focus of her research has been on worker ownership and participation. She's currently involved in a four year development. Um, oh, she was involved in the development of the Co-op Index Diagnostic Tool for worker co-ops. And obviously a lot of that was linked to things around co-op identity. And, um, and she's now, I think, currently involved in a four year research project, which is funded by FWO Belgium, the Research Foundation, which is due to end in 2022. And that's looking at international cooperative governance. So again, another interesting area linked to co-op identity and internal values and principles as well as external measurement. Uh, amongst other topics, Sonia has also researched and written on defining uh, cooperative difference and on cooperative principles and values. Julia is Senior Researcher at Eurixi, which is the European Research Institute for Cooperative and Social Enterprise. Her research activities are focused on the role and potential of uh, social enterprises in Central Eastern Europe, the concept of social enterprise and its legal evolution. And we will have a seminar later that looks at legal frameworks, but again, the extension of legal frameworks in certain countries links also to co-op identity and values and principles. And hopefully we might get to hear a little bit about that as well, if we've got time. Um, she's also looking at new typologies of cooperatives and innovative pathways for integrating asylum seekers and refugees, um, as well as the role of a social enterprise in building a proximity welfare system. She has also been involved in coordinating several European and international research projects and is currently a member of the advisory board of two OEC projects, which are guidelines and good practices to develop legal frameworks of social enterprises and the social and solidarity economy from the margins to the mainstream. And a lot of what we were talking about in the first session around participation and involvement of communities and marginalized communities in particular will be of interest there as well. So we've got about 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes of, of uh, time for both our panelists to present and also to ask some questions before we, we take some of that presentation back into our groups to actually think about that in more detail and come back and ask some questions and stimulate and, and discuss some of the issues. So although the um, presentations are provocations in some way, they're also informative in terms of, of where each of our speakers are coming from and the key issues that they see linking to this topic. So I'm going to hand over to Julia first um, and then we'll follow up with Sonia. Thank, thank you. you very much, Jan, and thank you very much, Rory, for having invited me. It's a pleasure to be today here with you. So, as recalled by the first speaker of this seminar series, Marcelo Vieta, cooperatives emerged in the 19th century as defensive reactions to the harsh conditions engendered by rural poverty and the Industrial Revolution. 
they were not simply economic institutions by then. They were also social institutions that recreated solidarity among groups of people. And by defending the interests of their members, cooperatives promoted the interests of the entire community. When compared to nowadays, cooperatives' goals and needs reflected, however, the higher degree of homogeneity of society. Over the decades, cooperatives have become extremely diversified according to their location and field of operation. So, focusing on Europe, in some countries, also as a consequence of the building of national welfare state systems, cooperatives have been confined in given fields of activity, such as consumption, credit, and have somehow lost part of their social commitment. In some cases, this, they have even evolved into entrepreneurial forms that differ from investor-owned enterprises exclusively due to their ownership rights, rather than by virtue of their social orientation. So in some countries, the aim of promoting only the interests of members was moreover crystallized as compulsory by national regulations. Conversely, in other regions, uh, such as, for instance, Latin, Latin America, which was recalled before, many cooperatives have kept their strong social commitment. They have never, in a way, stopped pursuing the interests of the entire community and have also played a key political, the key political role of contributing to democratizing the economy. Recent political and social transformations that occurred over the past decades have provided cooperatives with new opportunities to reaffirm their ability to tackle social and economic concerns affecting local communities. In several countries, as it was already highlighted, new typologies of cooperatives have emerged. They are strongly rooted in, the, in forms of collective awareness, such as the need to promote social justice, protect the environment, as we have seen, support the social and professional integration of disadvantaged persons, and sustain the development of marginalized localities. I think I would focus, I would uh, recall three clusters of new cooperative typologies. Cooperatives that provide welfare services, for instance, educational services in Italy and health services in Japan. Cooperatives, con second cooperatives conceived as tools of social inclusion, for example, work integration cooperatives in many countries such as, for instance, Poland, Greece, and again, Italy. And third, cooperatives as vehicles for local development, for instance, in Quebec and France. Based on, on the research that we have conducted over the past years, the revitalization of the, this community dimension of cooperatives is certainly expected to increase in importance of the future given also the complexity, the increasing complexity of society and the growing challenges ahead. So how do we do, how do this new type of cooperatives differ from traditional ones? They differ, I believe, when it comes to the goals, the membership and the resources they draw upon. As for the goal, their goal is not simply to promote the interest of their members, like, for instance, the, the one pursued by traditional consumer cooperatives, which is to minimize intermediation costs and retail prices, or the goal of agricultural cooperatives to increase the weak power of producers. The goal of these new typologies of cooperatives goes beyond the boundaries of cooperatives' membership and the motivation that, the motivation that pushes members to engage and undertake a particular activity is precisely the generation of collective benefits and or the promotion of the needs of vulnerable people. So this new type of cooperatives question the traditional model of membership of cooperatives, which is traditionally based on a single stakeholding system. Why? Because by definition, these new cooperatives tend to engage different typologies of actors, of people, interested in participating actively and having different relations with the cooperatives, workers, recipients, volunteers, in some cases also public authorities. Last but not least, Given also the particular fields of general interest where these cooperatives are engaged, these cooperatives rely on a mix of resources, not only private market resources, but also public resources, public market resources and non-economic resources, like, for instance, voluntary work. 
and community assets. So what should be done to reaffirm the collective awareness that, I will be very fast, that boosted cooperative success in the 19th century. To exploit cooperatives' full potential, I believe cooperative re regulation should fully acknowledge the diverse role of cooperatives and permit cooperatives to operate in whatever industry in which they prove to be useful, which is not the case in all the countries. This includes sectors that benefit from public funding, have been traditionally public and are of public interest. At the same time, and then I will close, the, to size the opportunities offered by the current social and economic transformations that indeed call for participatory models of production and consumption, management practices that are more in line with cooperative values and principles should be adopted in my view. In essence, cooperative pursuing explicit social aims should further strengthen their links to with local up. communities. We need to wind you up. You've, you've yes, and adopt inclusive governance models that allow for a we fair representation of again. different stakeholders. Stop. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. I mean, there's a lot in there in terms of looking at both the internal management and also what's happening practically in terms of community level and social movement co-ops and social co-ops uh, sort of in different countries. I want to hand over to Sonia and then we can sort of follow up on, on both of those. Yes, I will take us a little bit more literally into the topic, uh, but uh, I appreciate Julia's connection to the previous uh, Mm. A group uh, where it really is all interlinked to me as well. So this is my five minutes. I'm going to time myself uh, and I'm hoping for broader conversations uh, afterwards. So uh, it, this is about updating co-op values and principles. And um, here is where I'm starting uh, this conversation. I want to consider the intent of the process behind the ICA statement of 1995 and Ian McPherson's writing in 2012 where he described the process and the challenges and the debates. Uh, and so where they landed on after uh, broad global uh, conversations, they landed on the shared values, the six plus four, so the 10 values that you're all familiar with. And this was a global agreement. So the global cooperative movement agreed that these are the values that they share. Um, they were less in agreement about the principles themselves, but they saw the values as uh, leading into guiding the principles. So we landed on the seven uh, principles. These are the guides and they're general principles. And this is something that I don't think we're dwelling on enough at all. These are general principles. And what the group foresaw was that there would be additional operating principles to be developed by different types of co-ops. This is where we are. That has never been done. Uh, at least not deliberately and not to my knowledge. And this is the missing piece that is a continuation to 95 intent in my mind. So what are those additional operating principles and the way that they were thinking about it, that they have to be different for different types of co-ops and for different cooperative purposes and for different cooperative contexts. And they almost say it's, you know, up to the co-op on the ground, a co-op, <laughs> right? One co-op to figure out what its principles will be, but they're guided by the general principles, the seven. And so what we already know and what we're already seeing is that Mondragon has developed 10 because you know their context is labor matters first and foremost. Uh, and so you have, you know that what, what Mondragons are, but, uh, but it's all about work and sovereignty of labor and capital being instrumental, but not the boss and so on. Then there is the Global Alliance for Banking of Values that includes more than co-ops. It's not just cooperatives, but those who are co-ops in the group abide by Global Alliance for Banking of Values principles. And among them is the key principle that, that we are not talking about in financialization of the economy, which is that they are financing the real economy and they measure that, okay? Everybody else is, is running away from that. Um, agricultural co-ops that who care and who are radical are actually abiding by the principles of agroecology. And I think this is where we live in today's conversation about sustainability, because when you look at the principles of agroecology, it's all of the above. And at, uh, well, sorry, not all of the above, apparently Julia is going, on, but there's a lot in it, okay? So anyway, but this is, for, I think, it's where we need to discuss and debate. And then again, it's, it's context specific. 
And then there are others. There's specific purpose in fair trade and the principles of fair trade and so on. So these are just uh, some of those principles in global alliance and the agroecology. Uh, and I will quickly go through them to not lose my time there. But in agroecology, you are talking about diversity, synergies, the resilience, recycling, co-creation, sharing of knowledge, human social values, and the last but not least is circular and solidarity economy. So, you know, so all of that is within the agroecological principles. Um, the, this is from Ian, and I just want to point to the bolded bits, their thinking back then in 95, that it's up, up to each local co-op to work out how the general principles apply and given their situation to figure out what operating principles fit them, um, that they are open for renegotiation pretty much every 30 years. <laughs> and this is where we are right now. And it's because new generation of leaders is emerging and because certain economic, political, social major shifts happen. Uh, and we are seeing some of those shifts, of course. Um, and then that the, the impact of the values is critical. They're open-ended, they can only be the guides and that those values actually will grow as cooperators and cooperatives strive to live their values more completely. So that's from Ian. To me, the conversation about new cooperativism is, this is what I'm pondering about. What is special about new cooperativism? How new is really new? So I'm happy to see that Marcelo is pulling us back into more radical roots rather than saying we're now reinventing the wheel. How new is new and what is new about it is, is what we need to ponder a little bit more as researchers, I think. Is it new only in some cultural context? Is it where consumer co-ops have dominated and single member sort, uh, single member type co-ops have dominated that this is becoming a news you know, in, in many contexts, multi-stakeholdership is alive and well, has been as long as co-ops have been around, and they just don't have a law that calls it that. But then we have legal structures that allow multi-stakeholdership, starting from Italy and moving on. Now we are rediscovering that as a new model. It isn't. We have German, German co-ops that are multi-stakeholder. We have Croatian and former Yugoslav uh, co-ops that are multi-stakeholder, and on it goes, right? And these are the ones I know. There's plenty that I don't know. In the context of indigenous communities in, in the Canadian North, my goodness, you know, they, they're multi-purpose, multi-stakeholder, you name it. Um, so is the statement as it is, statement on the cooperative identity problematic in any way for new co-op developments? And what's bothering us? We need to identify what is not there, <laughs> right? And can we interpret what's there to, that suits the purpose of what it is we're trying to accomplish? And to me, the last but not least, is this newness so that we can give voice, voice to capital? And if that's the case, then we have a Trojan horse as far as I'm concerned. So that's where I would like us to kind of dwell on it. Thank Thanks, you. Sonia. I mean, I think there's, there's a really interesting uh, challenge there for us to actually think about in the groups in terms of, of both newness and return to roots or return to a different looking at roots as new organisational forms uh, are appearing or different kind of forms coming out of so social movements and how people are interpreting them. And I think that's really quite interesting. So that that kind of leads to, to one of my sort of high level questions in terms of, you know, we're talking about the principles need to be, or some people are talking about the need to revise print the principles and values and as you say, you know, it was always open to revision every 25, every 30 years. But what's in there and what you've pointed to, and this kind of fits also with what Julia was talking about, about different legal environments allowing different kinds of things to happen, is the operating principles and that they're different for each of the uh, sectors and the types of organizations are in there. So if you were, if you were looking at the, the principles in terms of fit, is there a need for a hierarchy of principles that we're often told about, like the first four uh, principles are the ones that define the co-op identity, whereas with the social movements, we've got more emphasis on education and community embeddedness. So I'm throwing that up to you in terms of, of how might those principles be looked at in terms of the context that we're talking about now. Sonia, do you want to follow up with that? Because you were talking about that, that very much and then Julia. Yeah, I can, I can take it. I know, I know from everything we've read and seen and discussions we've had that the seven principles are not meant to be split apart and, and categorized and you know, uh, prioritized that it's the whole package that the whole statement on the cooperative identity, the definition of what a cooperative is, 
with the values that they've agreed on and the principles that follow. That whole thing is what matters. However, legal systems and legal frameworks usually go for the three. They don't dwell on how are you going to live by your remaining four because it's difficult to, you know, how, how do you make sure what is care for community? And many credit unions in Canada will tell you, oh, they care for community. They give them a lot of money. Uh, and that's where they stop, <laughs> right? So, so, you know, do they not care for community? I guess that you can always argue that they do. So anyway, so this is not what entered legal frameworks. And it's problematic in many ways, right? It's, it's difficult. Um, so yeah, so I wouldn't prioritize them personally. I would say it's all of the above. And since I live like many of you in education spaces, what we have on our hands is to educate managers of co-ops and decision makers in co-ops that they do have the seven and the values and they need to think how to operationalize that and that there is a broader community to worry about, right? So this is what the education piece is doing to the old co-ops, but the new co-ops start probably from, uh, you know, radical <laughs> ideas or, or, or new ideas or care for community. Anyway, I'll stop. I'm sure Julia has. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, Ian, Ian's raised an interesting, Ian Adley's raised an interesting point in chat just there in terms of is, is it principles or is it guidelines? And you have both talked about guidelines in that sense. Um, Julia, I mean, following on from, from that in terms of the different context, I mean, you, you were particularly sort of concerned around the evolution of the cooperative form, not necessarily the legal structure, but the different cooperative forms that are, that are coming into, into view, and whether or not they have been disruptive in their focus on, on that commitment to social and community. And you've provided some examples of that. Can you, can you provide some additional examples maybe that sort of link and, and um, describe that a bit more? Sure. I think that depending, so we know that cooperative development is uh, an ongoing process. So it's, it's a natural evolution in a way because cooperatives are very flexible uh, organizations that respond to needs of uh, either specific stakeholders or of the whole community. So it is obvious that they must reflect also the change in needs that occur in society. But if we look at the new type of cooperatives, depending on the country and its regulations, uh, the emergence of these new typologies has in some cases required a dramatic change in, I would say dramatic, but a very strong change in legislation, or it has occurred naturally. In Italy and France, new regulations were introduced, which recognized in Italy in 1991, a new type of cooperative, social cooperative, which was mentioned by Michele. In France, a, a revision of, the, of cooperative law enabled to introduce a new form of cooperative, the SIC, the Société Coopérative d'Interêt Collective, which pursues the interest of the community and must obligatory include in its membership three typologies of stakeholders. And in Germany, the revision of the 2006 Cooperative Society Act has put new type of cooperatives with a social aim uh, or cultural aim at the same level of traditional cooperatives. And these cooperatives manage, for instance, uh, village shops in remote depopulated areas. So previously in, in Germany, cooperatives pursuing goals other than the economic interest of their members were not admitted by law. Nevertheless, if we look at other countries, like for instance, northern countries such as Sweden and Finland, but also Japan, so the legal system does not pose obstacles to cooperatives that decide to take on new responsibilities. And so the emergence, for instance, in Japan of health co cooperatives has not been such as much disruptive as in Italy, where there has been a very long discussion with the engagement of the cooperative movement, and there has been, there was the need to introduce a new regulation, which actually uh, is revolutionary because it moves from the aim of promoting the members to the aim of promoting the interest of the community. And this is, was a very big change in our country. Yeah. Can so, I, uh, sorry, can I add to this? Um, because uh, in the work that's being done with the ILO on these cooperative statistics, what appeared is the following, that there are really four types of co-ops. And 
And there are a million types of socially defined co-ops. So we have youth co-ops, we have women's co-ops, we have uh, YZs, we have, uh, you know, uh, veterans co-ops in Croatia, for example, we, you name it. So it's a social construct and a political construct in many contexts. But really, it's either who are the members? Is it workers? Are they producers or self-employed? Are they uh, consumers or are they a multi-stakeholder type? So that's what we landed on the four, right? But then legal frameworks are, oh my goodness, you know, and this is the challenge that national statistics are in, impossible really in, in many contexts because they don't quant quantify them or they don't qualify them by the four, but they really go into the purpose that they serve. So you're right, that purpose that they serve, there will be energy co-ops and the legal frameworks treat them differently, regulators treat them differently. And this is the complication, of course, the complexity of it all. But do we as researchers call them new cooperativism yeah. or do we not is what I think we need to um, think yeah. about. Yeah. It, I and, think and whether that takes away from the actual we, we focus in terms of what we're looking at in a general way. Yeah, definitely. We need to move into groups. I mean, one of the things that I'll just throw out there as well, though, just before we go, was one of the things Sonia was saying about what cooperators have, either, you know, sort of practitioners rather than researchers, if you like, have at the, on their hands or in their hands are the practice guidelines. So if we're looking at how those work in practice, how do we engage cooperators and practitioners and people on the ground who are running the organizations into thinking of how we look at these new or extended or merged principles or whatever we're talking about as well. So maybe that's something we could come back to at the end. But what I'd like to do is, is ask Rory to, to move us into yeah. to groups to actually maybe just think there's a lot of stuff coming out of there. So sort of think about some of the things that you might think need to be expanded on or reflected on or actually challenged in that sense too. Okay, so the, the breakout rooms will be random. Um, I'll create breakout uh, rooms with hopefully five in each. Sonia, Julia, you, I can't stop it issue you in, issuing you an invitation, but if you decline the invitation, you can stay in the main room and we will have our own conversation with Jan. Um, uh, so we'll, have, we'll form our own breakout room, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so everybody else, uh, you should get an invitation any second now. You should get your invitation now. And we'll call you back in about 20 minutes. Yes. Yeah. So thanks, folks. That was quite dynamic. <laughs> I'm saying if we both speak like this, that's why it's dynamic. Yeah, with hands. <laughs> uh, I'm Italian. I can't help. I mean, this is the way I, I am. Like no, it's, it's very good that we're still recording, by the way. So this. Oh, this that's OK. OK. And it's, uh, it was interesting. And, and Sonia and I had a little exchange in the chat and you were alert, alerted to it. Um, this this issue of whether it's really new or not, I think mm. it's a call for rediscovery and renewal, isn't it? Yeah. It, it sort of reminds yeah. me of um, uh, some of Chris Cornforth's work about the fact that worker co-ops don't always degenerate, that they can sometimes refresh and renew when mm -hmm. they hit a crisis. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's also like the underlying message of quite a lot of the stuff around community development and commons and stuff isn't new. It is around re reinterpreting that and reusing that in the context that we are. And I think we get stuck up, stuck on new versus old or good versus bad. It's this, you know, it's this two legs good, four legs bad sort of thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have to say that in Italy, uh, if we look at social cooperatives, there are also very, let's say, traditional social cooperatives that wouldn't be I wouldn't describe them as new and as innovative as connected with social movements at all. No. So uh, there is not just one trend, which is th there is a huge um, diversity and variety of situations and of evolution of individual cooperatives, which needs to be taken into account. But of course, we also as researchers must uh, highlight the contradictions, the obstacles that hamper the emergence of, of new cooperatives and the development of cooperatives, the evolution of cooperatives towards stronger, a stronger social responsibility. So, of course, we must look at the regulations because sometimes the regulations prevent this and they are a very big obstacles. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, speaking about the single stakeholder or single uh, member type, uh, I know that some cooperatives here in, in the province of Nova Scotia have in fact created new cooperatives with a different stakeholder group because by law they have to be a single stakeholder, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But then they actually mm-hmm. support each other. And so they created it so that they can get support from this new Yep. Instead of, you know, bringing yeah, them yeah, into yeah, yeah. stakeholder shape, they actually created the independent entities that are networked. Which is what was being talked about, that, about the intercooperation, the co-op. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's mm-hmm. principle six, isn't it, in terms of mm-hmm. yeah. between co-op yeah. rather than being merged. But, uh, yeah. 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 fascinating conversation with two people from Fair B&B because they, they've established themselves in, in Bologna as a worker co-op with 66% voting power for the workforce and... 33% power for their sort of investment supporters, I suppose. They do have voting power, but they want to extend membership to what they call their ambassadors, the people who mm-hmm. localize and do it. And so we were looking at mm-hmm. um, sort of an internal council, an internal multi stakeholder council, but we also talked about like mm-hmm. a, co-op, a co-op of ambassadors that then joins in a European co-op. With there you go. B. So, mm-hmm. There is more than one way that you can mm. uh, bring a, around the, mm. uh, the multi-stakeholding. Mm. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, two years ago, with a group of friends, we have set up a labor cooperative in Lombardia, which is aimed at integrating to work migrants, so asylum seekers and refugees. And we couldn't register as a social cooperative because mm. uh, migrants are not disadvantaged workers formally. So we registered as a worker cooperative, but, and we would not have been allowed if we didn't have a social enterprise uh, legislation in Italy, because we engaged in our group, we, I'm volunteer because I have another job, but there are of course workers and there are, uh, let's say investors who also participate in, 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 uh, in the membership. And we were able to, 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 to develop, to emerge as a, as a labor cooperative because we have the qualification of social enterprise. Otherwise, we would not have been allowed to have volunteers. Mm-hmm. 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 And yeah. this, is, yeah. this is absurd. But as a labor cooperative, you, yeah. you are only accepted to have workers. So, but I, I have another job and I wanted to participate. <laughs> uh, so we, after months of study, of studying, of analysis, cost benefit analysis about a different legal solution, we ended up establishing a labor cooperative, a worker cooperative with a social enterprise qualification. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and this is why you need cooperative developers to mm-hmm. set up co-op because they know the ropes. If you just leave it to any old lawyer, no, please, please, no, 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 lawyers, no, 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 no. It's a, it's a problem for sure. It's a problem, but it's yeah. a problem because there are not experts whatsoever that are able really to support. I think mm-hmm. new mm-hmm. groups, new voluntary groups, or new groups of people, community groups that are interested in setting up new cooperatives. The mm-hmm. support we gained from the 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 local federation of cooperatives was really crap mm. i wouldn't oh, have wow. to say that i wouldn't have to say wow. that but and i'm talking as a person who studies cooperatives so mm. I, i'm also privileged because i can count on the support of my colleagues but what about a group of people who have no experience and no contacts so mm. how many cooperatives are we missing yes yes mm. Yeah, or who are told to set up as something else. I mean, that's the key thing, isn't it? You know, so you get so many organisations who want to actually do something, but they find that they can't because they, like in the UK, they're registered as something else, and that prevents them doing what they want to do because they've not had the advice that says, well, what is it that you want to do? Do you want to engage with, um, you know, sort of a a, a multi-stakeholder, or do you want to be able to raise money from? sort of this kind of stuff. I still so, think yeah. that this disciplinary area is, is about, it's about how you shift a multitude of configurations and, and legal structures in the direction of the cooperative movement. It's That's what's happening, think, yeah. It, yeah. It, this is what I think is what Julia's talking about. And I know, Sonia, we've had a whole dinner evening over 
because in some countries, I mean, you, you've got you've got lovely, legis relatively benign re legislation for multi-stakeholder co-ops in in Quebec and and across other parts of Canada, which we don't have elsewhere. Um, I, I mean, I didn't realise how much I would struggle to get protection for the member groups when we went through the FCA in the UK. So. Yeah. We've got a real fudge, but we have done something that is legally mm. defensible, which is mm. to have a stakeholder council that has real power. Mm. But that that stakeholder council could be removed by the General Assembly. I mean, it's it's not it's not ideal. Mm. It has a specific power to protect the position of different member groups within the co-op. Yeah, it's really interesting. And yeah. as I said, I mean, because of you know the the Yugoslav history, I mean, in Croatia, you just yes. set up a co-op, yeah. and any member, anybody who wants to support the purpose of the co-op can be a member. Yes. And so you have a co-op of uh, you know urban planners who have architects, urban planners, uh, journalists, mm. and uh, I don't even know what <laughs> the other community member is, but they all pay their dues and they all support the purpose mm. of the co-op, which is quite radical. And can so you know so. Answer? Can I ask it's a question that both of you might be able to answer, which is when we were in Canada in Montreal for the ICA conference last time, um, AUM um, presented a paper on the classification of co-ops, which you talked about the four. Um, and I, I went in search of that as a working paper of, because uh, it was, it was he sent it to me as a working paper of Syriac or Sicopa. I can't remember which. Syriac, it would be Syriac probably, yeah. yeah. It's on the ILO. Yeah, I couldn't find it in the list of working papers. So what has, has that... Has that classification stalled or gone forward or what's... It's what's gone forward. forward. There are the guidelines on cooperative statistics that has have been built, yeah. but it's on the uh, International Labor Organization's website. Mm -hmm. I, I look okay. up. I right. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Sorry, it should Dan. be I look up. And now uh, Marie put out a book based on it. And it's also free uh, online there. Marie Pareto? Uh, no, Marie, Marie Bouchard. 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 Okay, thank Marie you. Marie Bouchard, and because it was Marie Bouchard and Syriac International that were that were involved in this, it's under the Syriac banner, right? Mm. Um, I mean, just going back to the principles and values and stuff. Um, I mean, the examples you gave there around Mondragon having their ten principles, or you know, sort of stuff like that, and that's. I mean, it, what's been shown over a period of time is that when you when you talk to co-ops and you ask them about the ICA principles. They, they don't know what they are or they know some of them and not others so yeah. I mean this is the thing around well you know yes they're there as a background support but but where do they link in with what what organizations are actually doing for themselves where's where are they talking to each other mm. um otherwise I, I, ICA principles are going to be stuck there aren't they unless we get the 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 review of those and the Mondragons and the others and but even small co-ops, you look at them and they've got their own set of, of guiding principles, not always linked to SDGs, but linked to what they want to do locally in their in their locality and with the groups yeah. that they're working with. And they're just as legitimate because they can measure what they're doing against those. They can evaluate what they're doing. Yeah. And I just wonder about that, that kind of relationship, really. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you're in the ICA membership, in some way or another, uh, you live under a rock if you haven't heard of the principles, you know? So I, I don't know of co-ops these days. It may have been that way nowadays, but you're right that they may not know them all or mm. understand, but the, this general understanding of we are a co-op seems to mm. live there. But I like, uh, I think Roger wrote about that, this ideal type of co-op, there mm. are two and not one. And the first one being financial benefits, you know, the market, failure kind and really financial benefit to members and the other the one we we're talking about mm -hmm. so so even there understanding or why are you as, as Rory actually in the chat in the last session wrote it depends on why members got together so mm -hmm. <laughs> you know if they got together so they can share costs and many do or scale up then that's going to be their concern and the question then is how do you educate and how do you push that a little bit beyond and how do you you know so there's the education piece but then others we're attracted to the na nature of cooperatives and so on. So it, it's, a, it's a complex space. I don't know what to say. I mean, but the ICA's job is mm -hmm. to educate its membership and to have these debates and they try. Uh, I don't know how successfully uh, necessarily, right? But that's what they're doing. This whole Congress this year is about that. I was gonna say that I think there is a lack in education and in awareness of many cooperatives about the cooperative principles. And this is also somehow 
I think, confirmed by the tendency of many cooperatives of mimicking traditional enterprises. So they are not very much aware or of their added value, of their specific, of their specificity. And so they tend to be fascinated by trends or by, by things that are not by, let's say, by, um, for instance, tools and models that are not really um, uh, capable mm. of uh, strengthening their capacity to capture new needs mm. or their capacity to, to, uh, to uh, promote democratic management models. So I can see this perfectly in Italy now, not only as a, as a researcher, but also as a, a cooperator. And I fight against this. Mm. I think that's where I was coming from with that last mm -hmm. throwing question about, you know, how, what tools can we help with or give to, or what they, people can use to actually transition organisations or do, or do the kinds of things that you're saying, actually put things into practice. Will the sort help? The cooperative sort? Um, it can't be, uh, well, it's difficult because it's not, it's not, in, it can't be international in that sense. So it, again, it'd be up to local I mean, interpretation. I mean, I mean, the group at, at, at CIARC, I mean, I think um, mm. one of our... Uh, Maureen is the working on source, Maureen right? Of it. Yeah, Maureen yeah. has got some funding in the UK to create working groups here. Mm. And then I know that um, Maureen argued that the international sorts for charities was triggered by the adoption of the SORP in the UK. In other words, other countries then began to follow mm. suit once mm. one country had, mm. had uh, convinced the IFSA that you could have a, a charity SORP. Mm. So, but um, I don't know whether the conversation has gone, whether it's heading in the direction of the SDGs or whether it's heading back towards co-op values and principles. Mm. Mm. I think it's back to co-op values and principles. I, I don't think they're mixing the two as far as I... Yeah. No, but I, I may be wrong. Yeah. But it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, Jen, what you're saying. Uh, so, so there are two attempts. So to me now, looking again back at what I was saying, uh, Ian's work, um, it, it, do these general principles need some revamping, right? And so, so there is clearly is the operationalizing the principles bit that we're missing. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, not we, you know, all of us, but as I said, Mondragon has them and others do. But in, the question is, are, is there anything missing in the general principles? Mm -hmm. And there's a push, there was a push from Latin America to include environment as a separate principle so that it's yeah. really prominent. Mm -hmm. um, although you can argue that it is in the values, it is, it, it even uses yeah. the word sustainability and it's about care yeah. for communities and sustainable yeah. communities. And it's coming mm -hmm. from this concern. Yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Ian is writing in his piece that that's where it's coming from. But mm -hmm. the, the one that's being pushed now is DEI. The, the diversity, equity, inclusion. Yeah. And that's on yeah. the table for this Congress because yeah. Americans are pushing that one. Yeah. And it should be a general principle is, it, yeah. you know, I yeah. think it's not, it shouldn't be context specific. It, it should be everybody's concern. So this yeah. is going to come in. Yeah. I, I think it would be- and I think that's, sorry, sorry, Rory. I was sorry. gonna say, I get the, the sense that solidarity needs if, if further definition, um, you know, well, when, again, if you're a worker co-op, you know what solidarity is about, and nobody yeah. in a consumer co-op is going to accept that. What is solidarity? Yeah. We've legitimized solidarity based around the common bond of a member group, but we haven't legit legitimized solidarity between between member groups. Um, in right, that's what would be well, interesting. Well, in practice, I think bond. it does in multi-stakeholdership. I, I, again, we, you know, being from a multi-stakeholder school board. Uh, we definitely were fighting as consumers for the pay for workers that we should yeah. be higher, even though it meant that we should pay more, right? So, so you have that solidarity if labor is in the mix. But when, but it might be uh, interpreted locally. I'm just thinking, has it been yeah. interpreted from the movement's perspective as to what? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. really, I, I recommend everybody read that, that chapter. It's brief from Ian, I think. You know, it's fascinating. He says that all of this was hashed out and talked about, yeah. and different yeah. movements, different social movements were unhappy with the final outcome. Yeah. Uh, you know, people who were, you know, advocating for movements were not happy with the outcome and whatever. So he, I think it's really interesting, mm. but we need to talk about it. Yeah. Mm. I and I think it's also important that we talk about uh, one of the things that was mentioned a couple of times was about the tick box 
sports exercise with the SDGs. And it yeah. seems to me that, you know, that care for community has been pushed further and further down that route of that tick boxing exercise on, on, yeah. on in that. And the other aspects of the social movement stuff, the solidarity stuff have been forgotten, not forgotten, but you know, sort of not as prominent in terms of what, yeah. what that means. I think, I think we should reflect and the cooperative principles should in a way incorporate also this aspect better of diversity, as it was mentioned, which is, I think, not uh, sufficiently clear. Whereas mm -hmm. I would say that the seventh principle captures also solidarity with new generations. So in a way, uh, uh, the SDGs uh, should be somehow included, but maybe made more explicit. Maybe maybe it should be oper better operationalized the principles, so as to highlight uh, how can we, uh, in a way, uh, actualize them, adjust them to the changing conditions of because now we have a pandemic, we have a environmental crisis with no, which was not as severe when in 1995 when the, the, the seventh principle, for instance, was uh, introduced. So it was very revolutionary, the seventh principle. Now it, it seems obvious to have uh, such a principle. Mm -hmm. On SDGs, uh, I've, I've, I'm contributing to some work from UNRAIS. Um, on this and uh, the, the, yeah, it is Andres, the Institute for Social Development. Yeah. Um, and what they're doing is looking at social solidarity economy and okay. how it can inform uh, SDG indicators. Mm -hmm. And there I see the space that cooperatives can be the leaders. If they don't think, oh, here's a package, how do we take it and adapt it? Mm -hmm. But rather, how do we push the envelope and push the agenda? Mm -hmm into what we really want to do. So the mm -hmm. radicalized version of it. And so I'll mm -hmm. give you one example that an indicator of highest to lowest pay differential, social indicator, right? Yeah. Highest to lowest pay differential is normal and natural for co-ops, but corporations really you know, don't want to touch it. And these indicators that they're developing are for everybody. So for, for, for you know, any kind of enterprise, but it's informed by what the purpose of social solidarity economy is. Because and there are plenty of those that we can actually, I'm, I'm just finishing a paper for Syriac on that. Uh, there's plenty of areas where we can be the leaders in this space rather than just adopt SDGs and say, you know, but as a package, yes, the intent of SDGs, absolutely. But specifics are a little bit trickier. But also I think it will be very important in a way to penalize those cooperatives. And I was thinking before when you were presenting at many agricultural co cooperatives, mm -hmm. which use so many pesticides, mm -hmm. but so many pesticides that it's just <laughs> mm -hmm. not acceptable, exactly. not acceptable. So I think cooperatives also need rules yeah. to, mm -hmm. to make sure that they uh, they uh, effectively contribute to to and to powers in the constitution for members to hold the cooperative to those rules. Mm. That's that's, that's crucial. The pressure. Well, one thing was interesting. Yeah. Tony Webster is one of our historians. He said what was so powerful about the early days of the UK retail co-op movement was the power that members had mm -hmm. over over their co-ops mm. uh, to hold them to uh, serving member interests. Ah, huh. um, interesting. Yes, uh, and that was and lost. that changed then. Eh? Yes, it was lost in the sort of reorganization post World War Two. That's what he argued. Mm. Ah, yeah. yeah, interesting. But it was also the power of the retail over the wholesale as well. Yes, in that mm. sense. yes, um, and using that power to actually move away from the co-op wholesale to actually buy from private yeah. providers. So yeah, mm -hmm. and that's also a little bit. I mean, for someone who is in love with cooperatives. It means that many consumer cooperatives have not been really able to adjust themselves also to the new request of some consumers who are asking for a different attention to, to local products. And mm -hmm. but we can see this fully in yeah. Italy. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to close the rooms now. So that was a good discussion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, We're back. Have we got everybody back? I think we have more or less. Great. Well, I hope you've uh, had good discussions in your groups. I think we've got four groups, so that should hopefully allow uh, a reasonable amount of feedback and discussion from each of the groups. So perhaps if I just sort of pick a number, I don't know, do you know your group numbers? 
No, okay. Maybe somebody wants to raise a hand then from one of the groups to actually do the initial feedback. Sorry, I can tell you if you like. Oh. So, so group one was Anna, Francesca, Ian, Marco and Matt. Mind feeding back unless anybody else really wants to. <clears throat> um, we, we talked about some of the challenges that I sometimes face when you start talking about changing the principles. There's almost a kind of knee-jerk opposition to well no those are the principles and that you, you know uh, yeah how, how dare anybody sort of question them can be the the knee-jerk reaction people sometimes sometimes face um we, we heard about some of the challenges that people have faced trying to set up things like multi-stakeholder cooperatives and how that how that translates um one of the other aspects is in terms of the definition you know the definition is a minimum standard that people have to meet to be a cooperative a minimum statement and, and actually um, when it comes to the, the, the principles is there something about pulling out of the principles of things that are actually principles and then pushing into operational guidance the bits that are actual operational guidance you know principle three in particular half of that is operational guidance about what to do with money some of it is quite hardwired underlying principles though, that everybody recognize so it's a little bit about the importance of the definition and, and linking back to that and, and, and how that um, feeds through into the work. Um, mm. And then there was some debate and discussion as well around the kind of the solidarity aspects, the, the, the movement building aspects within cooperatives and what's the best way of doing that where if you've got a small housing co-op that doesn't want to release its funds to develop another housing co-op because its members are happy and don't want to do that, and, and the kind of the, the balance and interdependence between principles around education and you know, for community and cooperation with cooperatives and how those start to interbalance along with the voluntary nature of it and the, the democratic control aspects and how those are all reconciled. Um, yeah. so they're the sort of things we've discussed. Oh, great, thanks. I mean, some of those I think also will, will fit back into a later seminar that we're looking at. We'll be able to look at them again from the legal aspect as well, I guess, Ian, and that's your your area too, which would be which would be useful. So I can take that. Are there any any comments on on um, the issues that Ian's raised in terms of similarities in other groups, or do you want to take us forward in terms of, of what you were talking about in your groups as well? Group two. Group two was Alex, David, Elizabeth, Mary, and Maureen. I, I don't mind going if colleagues are. Right, go on, Alex, you go. Right. Um, we, we didn't really choose um, what to talk about. We started off fairly general. I gave him an interesting discussion on glazing greenhouses, which was uh, <laughs> fortunately stopped by David. But um, the, the main thing that we got onto really was talking about autonomy and how in particular some legal systems force government into multi-stakeholder co-ops as, as part of their creation. But, but principally, we talked about credit unions in, in Wales in particular, and I, I mentioned our 2009 report, Jan. I still have a copy on the bookcase. Um, into, oh, shameless in, promotion, Alex, shameless absolutely. promotion. Yeah, but, but collective promotion. Um, about how we, we looked at credit unions and how grant dependent they were and, and identified quite clearly the fact they weren't seeing themselves as businesses. And we also talked about the fact how in, in many ways they don't always see themselves as co-ops. Certainly in, in, in the UK, they see themselves as credit unions. They don't regard the co-op values and principles as really applying to them. They think they're, they're somehow different and separate and how to such a large extent they've become grant dependent. And that's partly the, the, you know, the support that they've got from Welsh government, but they've had support from local authorities. Um, they've had um, the, the, the growth fund, of course, and other funds since that have really latched them onto government poverty programmes. And they don't, unlike the Irish credit unions, they don't see themselves as something for everyone. They see themselves as this uh, poor person's bank, which fundamentally weakens them. And they, they because they've only got poor customers, then they, they can't be self-sustaining. And, uh, and, and they end up being totally grant dependent. So we saw that. And, and that same thing applies in social enterprises, social enterprises, which we didn't talk about. Social enterprises lack democracy, but they also, most of them, because their definition of up to 50 percent of income coming in from from the state um, means that they are very, very often quite, quite strongly grant dependent, too. So yeah. autonomy, we saw as, as really the important principle that we ended up talking about. Oh, interesting. Any other comments from 
one one other comment maybe in relation yeah. to we discussed about this um interchangeable use between principles and guidelines and um we we did have an opinion that you know the import the importance of the use and the retention of the word principle because it it has a much greater meaning in in the sense that this it's about a, a principled way of doing business as well um as we were typically associated with and that by interchangeably using with the idea of guidelines means it can be you can choose to you can choose to be in or out um, of guidelines you know you can you can take the guidelines or you don't whereas we felt that principles um reinforce the importance that these are you know these are the principles we we adhere to um mm. and how, how would that fit with what ian was saying about um differentiating within the principles between what is a principle and what is an application, if you like? Yeah. Well, I think what we what we what we did highlight was that sometimes that principle of concern for community, which I think Ian Ian, Ian was talking about, is not very widely um, illustrated in in some of the examples we were talking about. And then Maureen had mentioned that perhaps maybe looking at some of the larger credit unions in in Canada. Um, would give us a better illustration of how those type of credit unions really do dem have a demonstrable effect on their communities and how they engage with it. Hmm. I would just add that uh, for me, principles um, have within them a, a DNA of ethics, an ethical approach. And that's why principles um, are, um, I think the principles is a better way of actually communicating who we are and what we are about. I think accountability also seems to me to be something that um, is lost in, in many quarters. And I touched at the end, but we didn't really have a proper discussion about how best we can actually infiltrate and influence state funded education curricula uh, so that, um, that there's more than cooperators um, using their limited resources to increase understanding and knowledge of the movement. Um, and we've been thinking carefully in the context of a Robert Owen 250th anniversary activities that we've been running uh, during May, which you can see details of uh, on, our, on our website about how we could move to the next stage of working with uh, young people in having a competition uh, with some good prize money around um, them starting up a cooperative community uh, newspaper um, so that they would be there were various themes would be identified such as sustainable development goals such as Robert Owen's legacy um, but the idea is that um, we would leave it fairly loose and open for people to uh, join us on that journey and and report uh, by May of next year uh, so it would be nice to actually communicate with or share uh, with others how they've uh, been tackling infiltration, influencing of the education system. Thank you, mm -hmm. Chair. And I know from the UK point of view, it's something that the new CEO of um, COPS UK is quite interested in, in terms of looking at um, uh, six, six form particular cur uh, curriculum development in terms of introducing co-op stuff. What, yeah. what are the different, Mind what are, you, in, infiltration sounds a bit militaristic, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, we, maybe we need to be, be very well organised and uh, determined and, uh, and, and patient. One of the difficulties we have with Corks UK um, is that essentially it's an English organisation. And you've got to recognise differences in policy and legislation uh, between uh, England and Wales. I mean, it doesn't matter what mm. Gove and, um, and mm. Johnson are trying to do in undermining um, devolution with the Internal Market Bill and so on. Um, but the education system is quite distinct. And, and if you come at it through an English prison, you'll get lost and, and you'll lose all credibility. So what needs to happen uh, is that Corps UK need to have a conversation uh, with educationalists in Wales and, and supporters in what we're actually trying, trying to do. Mm. Uh, rather than them briefing us on what they're doing. I think that much reminds more, us that uh, it, yeah, much more it is just an approach. centric yeah. And we've got European and, and other uh, examples from around the world. And actually, Julia was talking about the legislative 
frameworks of different countries that sort of inhibit or support different kinds of cooperative venture as well in that sense too. And Martin's mentioned um, Scotland, but I saw also referred to Northern Ireland Scotland, as well. Yeah. yeah, Anna says that infiltration could be subversive, not just uh, militaristic. So yeah, I like that, subverting <laughs> or disrupting, I think was Julia's word as well. Any other comments from that particular group or should we move forward to the, the next group? Mm. And room three was Alexi, Darren, and Grant, and Raphael. Raphael. Yeah, so I can say something and the others have to correct if I misremember. So basically our take in the discussion on updating co-op values and principles was that um, it's important to maybe start, so we had a bit of an educational context, I think, um, is to ask people what their values and principles are rather than asking them if they like the co-op principles <laughs> and if they're interesting. <laughs> and not because we think they're not interesting, but because it could be interesting to have a conversation about the values that people have um, and the principles and go, go that way. And I guess one aspect here was that this might be resonant, especially with the millennial generation, or you have studies that they have this resonance, so it could be a more empowering way of talking about the values rather than you know saying there is this set that somebody came up with. Um, and the other topic I think we touched on was the problem of kind of hegemony of different values. Again, in an education context where maybe there's a lot of being told what's supposed to be an inter enterprise and supposed to be a leader and what are the kind of values that come with that. So that it, it is interesting to see what our formats to challenge that or even Alexi is working or um, how to um, communicate um, cooperative possibilities for disadvantaged communities in Nova Scotia. What are maybe, um, Daryl said there, what are the right um, labels to even introduce the topic and that it's not misperceived perhaps in, right from the start as what this is all about. <clears throat> so that's the kind of discussion we had um, um, on, on, on the topic. Mm, good. Alexei or other members of the group, do you want to come in on that and add to that? Or? I'll just, I would just say that uh, I've brilliantly summarised, I can't really, there's not really much more to say other than I think it was just the power of participation really in developing um, principles and values from the ground up. Um, so literally, so if you were, for example, from the startup business and you said, what form should we take um, and just started from the members let's call it or the participants developing the, uh, your principles and values the power of actually having that as a start point as opposed to saying should we take on a, a social enterprise or cooperative uh, um, principles and values and then um, a bit like a, <clears throat> I think it was um, I think Maureen mentioned to me earlier about the cooperative uh, index identity tool that, that kind of you know afterwards then starting to think about uh, uh, um, whether there's a, a good uh, fit on that because it's comes if I come at it from a, um, uh, a finance or accounting perspective that uh, we all know that whether it's a budget a forecast a strategy or mission or vision the moment you get in, involved people from the beginning from the ground up things are much more likely to work and to be accepted than if you just say listen guys this, we're just going to buy in these principles and values and hopefully you'll you'll, you'll engage with them um, so that's mm. pretty much um one element of it mm. and that they're alive they're a live topic they're there to be there to be looked at and reviewed and revised not just put on the shelf in that sense as well yeah did anyone look at um the thing that sonia was talking about in terms of um uh i've forgotten what you was going to say now <laughs> um but in terms of looking at um how things can be interpreted in terms of the actual different organizations and how they're developing did anybody look at that kind of thing i know we've looked at context but on a on a more local ground so we we discussed it briefly because i think and noted the, the, the ilo's work on legislation talks about uses the phrase associative characteristics when looking at a co-op just we talked about examples of yeah, how open is open membership in a worker cooperative and what does that actually mean in practice? You know, it doesn't mean mm -hmm. that everyone can walk up and demand to be a worker and a member. Yeah, so there's what, you know, what's an acceptable probation period, etc. Likewise, cooperatives restricting membership on gender. 
you know, is it appropriate mm -hmm. in a cooperative looking at, I don't know, women refugees versus a working men's club? And those two different mm -hmm. examples in one context deemed fine in another, in another not quite justifiably so, but, you know, looking at those associative characteristics of what's the cooperative, not only what type of cooperative it is in terms of its members, but also what's it trying to do and, and looking at the guidelines, the principles, the definitions through mm -hmm. that associative characteristic lens. Mm. Um, been quite mm. useful. Mm. It, it, I wouldn't mind chipping in here in the, um, within the in the fair shares world. There's a book mm. brought out by Graham Boyd and Jack Reardon, which differentiates mm. what they call vanilla fair shares to what they call a fair shares commons. So mm. they introduce um, specific values around intergenerational solidarity and the creation of commons beyond an intellectual commons. So the original fair shares argued for an intellectual commons. They, they want commons to be managed um, uh, that go well beyond that and, and actively creating commons resources. But mm. they also um, recognise that commons don't necessarily mean a public commons, that the, the commons may be open to members, but not beyond the membership. But of course, the membership model is very open. It's much more open than the single stakeholder co-ops mm. that we, we, we talked about. What about the, the issue of, of, of newness um, that was, was raised, uh, you know, has been raised several times as well? And I'm thinking here again, Rory, about maybe your paper where you're talking about is new cooperativism progress or regress? And, uh, you know, we heard in the last session about um, returning to the roots of cooperativism in, in many respects so and Sonia was talking about this as well did that did this come up for folks did you did you rise to look at that challenge group group four are asking to do their feedback we forgot to give this oh group. I'm sorry yeah. sorry group four. group four was Catalina Dong Martin and Pat I mean I'm happy to have an initial go and then others can follow so we uh -huh. had a very productive and stimulating discussion, though not particularly structured. And the three points I would draw out of it, but as I say, the others may wish to come in separately, is first of all, we talked about trust as being essential to a successful cooperative. It's not kind of mentioned anywhere in, in that word, but it, I always think of trust as being the glue that binds a, a cooperative together. If there isn't trust among the members, then it uh, doesn't have a very long-term future is subject to management capture, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, secondly, we talked about, which comes back to the first session, about scaling up and uh, the importance of looking at federative uh, and other solutions in terms of just one cooperative growing bigger, and also mm -hmm. that being a voluntary uh, process uh, that, uh, for instance, in Mondragon, on a couple of occasions, co-ops have actually chosen to leave uh, Mondragon, um, which doesn't go different ways. So it, it has to be voluntary as, as the principles of fact state. Um, and finally, the balance between Julia's emphasis, this was very much around like community aspect dimension and so on. Um, and we talked about the back trying to achieve a balance between self-interest and community interest, that the self-interest of members is actually quite important and that without uh, understanding self-interest, uh, you don't necessarily get the motivation. Of, if members feel that their self-interest is entirely being ignored, you don't necessarily get the motivation and understanding of others uh, that you need in a cooperative. So I'll just leave it there and the others may want to come in too. Catalina or others from the group who might want to add to that? I think the key thing um, that came up in this morning that Catalina was talking about and that was, has been mentioned again here is around that interconnectivity, that, that cooperation between cooperatives, mm -hmm. if we look at uh, uh, the principles, um, as opposed to, not as opposed to, but in addition to multi-stakeholder, the one co-op that you were talking about there. I think that, I mean, we're, we're coming up to um, our final sort of 10, 11 minutes really. Um, so I think unless anybody's got anything they want to add or a question they want to pose, we'll, we'll keep an eye on um, the chat as well. I'm going to hand it back to our panel speakers to respond to some of those issues and maybe some of the, the, the topics and uh, challenges and opportunities that you've raised in 
from your discussion group. So, Julia, should I hand back to you? First? Yes, thank you very much, Jen. So, I will just try to uh, to reflect a little bit on what has been raised from from uh, the participants. So, I uh, also be I believe that the, the cooperative principles. Uh, uh, although uh, I think very um, fascinating and very uh, stimulating for, for a cooperative, because if we look at them, um, at the whole uh, seven principles, I think they are complete, but they need probably to be a little bit adjusted so as to capture also new sensitivities of, co of many cooperatives that are being increasingly engaged in, uh, and they are increasingly uh, they increasingly care about diversity, so social inclusion, for instance. So this issue should be better uh, explicited, should be made better explicit by the principles, I think. As far as autonomy, which was mentioned by some of the participants, I think indeed many, not with respect to credit unions, which I'm not very, with, with which I'm not very familiar with, but I can um, say a few words about many social cooperatives in Italy. So new type of social cooperatives that have lost their autonomy. Uh, they have lost their autonomy uh, because they have been fully integrated in the welfare system and have become very dependent on public policies. So they have lost their capacity to capture new needs. And we have actually noticed a correlation between some characteristics of some social enterprises, which are mainly cooperatives, social cooperatives, and the capacity to generate innovation, social innovation, and to address new challenges. And those cooperatives that are truly multi-stakeholders, because they engage in their governing bodies, also, for instance, disadvantaged workers are better capable of, uh, um, of taking on new responsibilities and addressing new challenges. Then uh, about uh, uh, education, I think it's definitely very important to invest much more on education and help uh, uh, cooperatives become better aware of their strength, of their added value, and in a way, encourage them to self-recognize in the cooperative movement, which is not always the case. And to do this, I think it's very important also to promote the values of collective, uh, the collective values of uh, uh, collective decision making, making, as opposed to some rhetorics which are sometimes quite popular among certain cooperatives about uh, the hero leader which don't help, I believe, uh, strengthen this, uh, um, the, the strength of cooperatives, which is, uh, um, which is connected with their local anchorage. Then, last but not least, about scaling up. One interesting dynamic in Italy uh, is that of uh, uh, establishing contracts among different cooperatives with a view to share specific, not, cons not creating consortia, which is very, very expensive because it, of course, implies creating a new organization, but getting in, establishing real contracts among different cooperatives with a view to um, setting up uh, new projects, but also with a view to sharing the workforce and especially vulnerable workers that are very difficult to employ. This very, very briefly, I tried to touch different things. I don't want to take away time from Sonia and from the last discussion. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Sonia. Thank you, Julia, and, and everybody else. I mean, this uh, we, we could spend months talking about this stuff, so it's kind of hard to, uh, you know, make key points. But I'll just say one thing, that I think the most uh, rewarding project I'm involved in is educating cooperative leaders, because that's what we do in, 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 in my uh, center. And what that means is that we have in the same room, people from worker co-ops, from uh, food co-ops, from credit unions, and from different parts of the world. And that is key, that they talk to each other, learn from each other. And so this new cooperative motivations actually motivates the old cooperative, <laughs> you know, leaders of old cooperatives to think, what are, what are we doing on this file, right? 
So social solidarity economy, uh, new movements, new kinds of cooperatives speaking to, uh, as I said, the old ones, we therefore have uh, the uh, manager of a credit union in remote community in, in, in Canada, who actually is saying, well, we should be a, co a community developer as a credit union. What, what are we doing with the money? And so they are initiators of a daycare in the community and they sit on the board of that daycare and so on, right? So they started to think about themselves as what can we do to actually build this community as a financial institution. And those kinds of cross uh, learnings are not going to happen uh, where we live, typically, <laughs> as researchers. So we need to find ways, and actually among you are many <clears throat> practitioners, so this is great. But it, it points also to the cooperatives and the kinds of education needed in cooperatives. They don't send their people to uh, you know, graduate schools, unfortunately. So not enough co-ops are being educated or not enough co-op leaders are being educated uh, in, in this way to try and, and debate and discuss and think and, and you know, reconsider what it is they're doing. On that and, and uh, what prompted me to this uh, last line I want to make, the, the difficulty of self-interest and, and collective interest. There are two issues, at least in, in this part of the world. One, the association. Associations are so critically important. And this associationism, principle six, yes, but really collective thinking is critically important. Yet individual cooperatives always question, what's in it for me? Why do I pay these membership fees? Uh, you know, is this worth to me? Where it proved critical and critically important was it during COVID that actually cooperatives in Canada could do democracy because they were in associations. Associations helped them to have AGMs online. And they help them to figure out where the grants are coming from that support their, their workers and so on. So associationism is extremely important. And now I think they learned, at least many did. And another one is education. So not enough of, of, of the right kinds of education and cross learnings are happening uh, that, that I think uh, we need to kind of spend more time on. Great, thanks, thanks, Sonia. Uh, I really want to thank Julia and Sonia for, for both popping and tailing this, this uh, seminar and thanks to everybody in terms of your contribution. I think there's been a lot of really interesting stuff raised both um, on our virtual uh, space, but also um, in the chat and Rory's been monitoring that. I think before we say goodbye for this session, I'd just like Rory to outline the upcoming seminars. Yes, uh, the next seminar will be on the 14th of uh, July, um, and there's two parts to that. So the first theme is innovations in um, legal innovations in multi-stakeholder co -ops. So we're returning to this issue of how multi-stakeholder co-ops can be formulated and, and, and accommodated within legal frameworks. Um, we have got Ian Adderley, for that, and who's I forget our second speaker at the moment. Oh, what it's uh, Carlo Borzaga from Eurixi, who's a, a, a very eminent researcher in this area. Um, and then after the break, the fourth theme will be on um, innovations in uh, funding mechanisms. Um, and we have got Steve Gill, who's involved in the Co op Exchange project. Uh, we did have. Um, uh, somebody who's a specialist in crowdfunding but unfortunately they've got a commitment so we need to recruit our second panelist for that so if you've, any of you have a suggestion of an excellent panelist who can talk about uh, financial platform co-ops or financial platforms for um, the new, new cooperativism then we would be very welcome to take your suggestions. Thank you everyone and I'd want to extend a thank you to Mary and Julia for facilitating the first one and obviously to Sarah and Michaeli for uh, being our panellists and in his absence Marcelo uh, whose video obviously set the scene. So thank you everybody um, and we'll, uh, the UK SCS will be making um, this, the video of these sessions available through their website. Um, and the research centre will be transcribing everything. Um, there's no reason not to share transcripts, given given that everybody has given their consent to uh, their contribution to be open. Yeah. OK, so cheers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. bye. Take bye. care. Bye. Thank you.